Okay, so good evening, everyone. Well, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, this is Cassandra for Giant 3D Tables. I'm David North. So, quick introduction. Whoops. Quick introduction to me. Uh, my background is as a Java developer, although I'm mostly a manager these days. I'm a dormant PMC member of the Apache POI project. I haven't actually contributed to Cassandra, mostly because it worked very well for us without alterations, as I shall now explain. So I work for a company called Core Filing. We're based in Oxford in the UK, and we work with financial data. So we allow regulators to specify what they want to know about the people they regulate or the companies they regulate, and we help those companies produce the data, and we use a standard called XBRL to do that. So uh, that's where I am. Uh, it's uh, 20 to 9 UK time, so I'm sure you'll forgive a little glimpse of my evening's drink. And uh, I suspect I might not use the full 40 minutes because it is the end of rather a long day here for me, but uh, we'll see how we do. So, as I imagine you all know, Cassandra is a NoSQL database that's uh, suited better to some applications than a traditional relational database. And I'm going to tell the story of one such application that we developed and how Cassandra helped us out, how we did the deployment, and so on. So, this here is our application. Uh, it's called Beacon. Um, you don't need to understand very much about the domain to understand what I'm going to be talking about, but I will just talk you through it quickly. So this is a web-based application, um, and what its job is to validate and view financial reports, um, either because you're a regulator collecting them from people you regulate and you want to inspect them, or because you're someone being regulated who wants to check what you've produced and make sure it's... Uh, in good shape. So the standards we use uh, include the ability for the regulator to specify a tabular layout for some data. And you can see an example here of a table. So you sort of got um, columns and rows, uh, perhaps a bit more detailed than a traditional flat table. You've got this kind of indentation, various different breakdowns. Um, but basically, it's a table of numbers. You could imagine filling this into a spreadsheet, and one of our other products lets you do that. Uh, this particular table is quite sparse. You can see that we've only got a couple of numbers in here. So we've got 55 and 66 euros. And these red indicators here show that these particular numbers participate in one or more validation errors, which is what you're sort of looking at on the right hand side. So all that is perhaps straightforward enough, but how is it done? Um, it's worth noting as well that, um, so you see this little drop down that says sheets at the top there. The standard actually allows customers, uh, allows regulators to specify three dimensional tables of the data. Now, normally this is either not used or is used in a very simple way, just so that you can uh, flip through multiple different identical looking tables just by changing a drop down to move through the third dimension. Uh, but it can be a handy way to ask people to report um, in an application uh, to report perhaps data for multiple different countries um, that's otherwise the same. So one thing we have to take into account in building this application is how to have an API that supports the view you're looking at here. Um, the other question then we had to ask ourselves as we were designing all of this is, well, just how big can these tables get? If I just go back to that one, this doesn't look particularly scary. All right, you can sort of see from the scroll bar at the bottom that it's perhaps 20 columns wide and perhaps 100 rows tall. But the standard, again, allows for what we call open tables. So uh, that's where only one axis is defined in advance and the other one repeats as many times as there are data points. So the classic use case of this would be a regulator asking you to declare the value of every asset that you hold. And if you imagine that you're a credit card company 
and every customer account you have on the books is an asset that needs to go in one of these tables, there might be two million of those is, is one of the biggest we've seen. So that's the sort of extreme edge of the performance envelope which we needed to handle in this application. Obviously, you're not going to have all two million rows on the screen at once in your web browser, um, but we have to give some way of paging through them and perhaps searching through them as well. So we did a bit of prototyping in the early days of this, and it didn't take us long to decide that representing these big 3D tables that can be of arbitrary shape using a relational database was going to be quite messy and lacking in performance. So just to emphasize, the standard allows each different regulator or each different user of the standard to specify their own table layouts. So there's no opportunity to have a table in any kind of data store that matches the shape of the table you show on screen. If you're trying to build a generic product, it's got to be able to store tables of generic shape. So you can imagine trying to do that in various ways. Um, but as I say, we tried, we tried prototyping it up in a relational store and it got pretty messy and pretty lacking in performance pretty quickly. So we revisited and said, okay, what can we do with Cassandra? Let's try that out. So within Cassandra, we decided we'll keep it simple. We're going to have effectively just a couple of tables one which represents cells and optionally the sort of issue markers on those cells and one which represents headers so by which axis you're on x y or z and what point you are along it and the headers might be stacked a few deep as well so the idea of storing all this information of course is to support the apis that allow you to work with that view we saw earlier so the APIs we were trying to support were, tell me what the headers are for the X axis or the Y axis um, for a given table, or give me this sort of region of populated cells. So on that second point, the user can't be looking at the whole table at once sensibly. So what the web application wants to do as the user scrolls around or as the user sort of pages through horizontally or vertically, is to say, here's a particular sub-region of the table. I'd like the cells within that region. As I say, the early prototyping suggested that you'd have a real performance headache trying to do this in a relational store. Cassandra seemed more encouraging, so that's the route we went down. So a quick note on deployment. Um, initially, so our application uses Kubernetes. So as far as possible, we wanted everything to be in Kubernetes. Um, one of the challenges we have is that we have to support this on site for some customers and in the cloud for others. Um, so if you have everything deployed using Kubernetes, including the data stores, hopefully that makes it as portable as possible between AWS over here, Azure over there, or a more traditional on-premises environment over there. So in the early days, it was pretty primitive. We knew somebody had made a Cassandra Docker image. So we made a very minimal Kubernetes manifest to say, all right, we'll deploy one of those, stick it on some storage and see how far we get. And quite far was the answer to that. However, we sort of stepped it up a bit. We, within a couple of years of working with Kubernetes, we wanted something more powerful and structured for doing deployment. A lot of people did, and it's called Helm. Uh, so Helm allows you to deploy and configure things on Kubernetes. It's sort of a, a way of packaging up some metadata about a given application and saying, here's everything you need to deploy on Kubernetes. You tweak a few settings and you go for it. There's a company called Bitnami who publish a lot of open source Helm charts and they do an excellent one for Cassandra, which allows you to scale your cluster up and down within Kubernetes, plug in the storage, change a few settings. It just works. So we moved on to that, and that's what we've been using ever since. Of course, once you've deployed something, you need to monitor it. Um, not quite sure how that URL made it onto that slide, but uh, there are a few things we need to do. Monitoring whether Cassandra itself is up and healthy 
fairly straightforward. We just started off with a really simple check that the uh, the port was listening, and we later evolved that slightly to run some more detailed health metrics. But checking that it's up and listening on as many nodes as they're supposed to be, and Kubernetes has various facilities built in to do that. The chart sort of gives you some capabilities there. Uh, the other thing we do is the various services that talk to Cassandra have health checking of their own, and those health checks try and connect to Cassandra and run a simple query. And so as part of those checks, you get a good idea of whether your connection to Cassandra is healthy. So that gives you another angle to make sure that the whole system is working as it should. Backup and restore had to be considered. So um, again, enterprise customers, some of, the, some of them on site, obviously our own use cases to think of. This is probably the simplest part of the whole system. There are a couple of shell scripts. One that connects the container, uses the command line tools to dump the data out of Cassandra through standard out, and you just zip that into a file. And then you have the reverse one that reads from standard in and loads back in in a restore scenario. It's really simple, but it doesn't need to be anything more complicated than that. Most of the data we keep in Cassandra, in fact, all of it could be recalculated from other storage. Um, but it would be expensive to do so because you'd have to process all the reports again. So we make sure we have a good backup and restore option. So far, we've only ever had to do it in a recovery exercise situation, but we're reasonably confident that it does work and we can train customers in how to do it. In some ways, of course, this is where Cassandra is simpler than relational stores because it's more of a social thing perhaps than a technological thing. but. If you're trying to deploy stuff on premises to customers, every customer has their own views on what relational database they want to work with. All right, if you support Oracle and you support SQL Server, you're probably okay. You can probably find one or the other of those somewhere in most SMEs and bigger. But actually, in some ways, it's much easier to turn up and say, my application needs a no SQL store. As long as you're prepared to support the customer in deploying and running Cassandra, they're much less likely to have a NoSQL store of their own and say, oh, no, no, but we really want this one. So in some ways, it kind of gets you out of that human-inspired dilemma of relational databases where everybody loves their particular one. And as a company selling to the market, you're sometimes stuck having to support and test the whole lot. So yes, on-premises and in the cloud, what I touched on there is that we have customers who are doing both. We keep meaning to take a look at this Amazon Cassandra compatible thing called key spaces, but if we've got to support a way of deploying it for our on-prem customers where they just supply storage and we put a Cassandra cluster on that, we've got that option anyway and we use it. So we just mount in a EBS volume on Amazon. That's how we've done our Cassandra since day one and it works remarkably well. So we, uh, we don't really, we don't really see the need to change that anytime soon. One of the things we have found over the years with Amazon is that it sounds very attractive when they have such and such as a service, but once you stray away from the key sort of relational databases where they maintain them and keep on top of them the whole time, things like Elasticsearch, sometimes you're stuck several major versions apart from where you want to be it's not evolving as fast at their end or it's evolving too fast at their end so there's quite a lot to be said for dodging that vendor lock-in bullet and as i say we've got to support on-prem customers anyway so it's not far out of our way to keep things portable and simple so yes on the client side most of our code that is uh talking to cassandra is written in uh, within the sort of Spring and Spring Boot framework. And Spring has a Cassandra connector module, which takes care of some of the boilerplate for you. Anyone who's ever done relational database stuff in Spring will know that you can use one of their modules to sort of hook up to Hibernate and take care of some boilerplate there. Similar thing exists for Cassandra. One of the nice touches in it is it can give you, if you're if you're writing sort of self-contained services, you can have Kubernetes ha compatible health check endpoints. It'll just sort of automatically contribute a, if you've got Cassandra configured in a service, it will automatically enhance the health check to ensure that it can get a connection into Cassandra. So that's all kind of built in and happens for you. So that's quite nice. 
So having set all this infrastructure up, we obviously wanted to test performance with some of our monster documents. Um, it's worth saying as well that we've kind of got it both ways around. You get the occasional customer with the occasional monster documents, and we have to be satisfied that the system will cope with those. The more normal case is you have a customer with, I don't know, a thousand or 10,000 or even half a million modestly sized documents, and then just the occasional monsters come along. So you've kind of got to test on two different axes and try mixing them. So write performance. Um, one of those documents in our XML standard that I mentioned may be an hour to process in total with those 4 million facts, but only a fraction of that time is the Cassandra bit. I don't think we've ever had to optimize the Cassandra piece when we've been doing optimization because in our application, you first of all have to calculate and validate the data you're going to save. Once you've done that, shoving data into Cassandra, if you've configured and sized your cluster appropriately, has never caused us a problem. And I don't think we've ever seen it turn up in our profiling as something that's been an issue for us. So that's perhaps a testament to how well it just behaves out of the box. I mean, you do have to make some intelligent deductions about how big your Cassandra cluster should be, not just for performance, but for um, redundancy and resilience as well. But that's all there is to it, or at least that's what we found for this use case. The read performance has been a win as well. It's near instant, and of course you can scale up. So for reading in particular, it's really handy because you can have a read heavy application. You can scale the Cassandra nodes up to uh, to match the scaling up of your, the horizontal scaling up of your services. It does, we haven't yet managed to make it degrade with big documents or lots of them, as long as you size things up and bear in mind your fault tolerance as well. I think, nine customers out of 10, we'd probably go for three nodes in our Cassandra cluster. And that's as much about resilience as it is about performance. Um, as I mentioned, the API we've got to have uh, allows you to specify the particular subset of the table you want, because fetching all 4 million rows would run into bottlenecks on the network. And you can't shove that much data into a browser and expect it to work. And you don't need to. A human can only be looking at a certain portion of it at once. But yeah, the fetching different sizes works really well. So the UI can just fetch what it needs. Uh, a simple extension was representing the empty tables to allow people to sort of browse through and say, well, what does it look like without any data in or to support a data entry scenario? Very similar pattern for us. We just had to work with the headers. Obviously, you don't really need to represent cells if there's nothing in them. So barely need to mention that was that did come later, but it was an obvious extension. So were there any downsides? I, I should stress that I'm not claiming to be a huge expert in Cassandra. Me and about four people on my team have worked with it from both the dev and the ops side for about the last six years doing this application. I think it's a testament to what a well thought out piece of software is that it is that we haven't felt the need to become super experts. We're comfortable. We understand enough to get some serious business value out of it. And isn't that the dream that you can work with components that uh, have been built by good people are maintained by good people? We try and give something back and report intelligent bugs and file intelligent patches with them. But in a case like this, it's been really smooth. One of the things we did find was migrations were a little bit messier to work with, but perhaps perhaps just because of the unfamiliarity of the tooling. So for relational databases, we've always used uh, Liquibase as our migration tooling. We have that very well understood and very well integrated. Um, you do have to figure it out a bit differently for Cassandra, but we did. Um, now that we've got all this worked out, what we do is we have the migrations run as a Kubernetes job, and that job has to run before any of the services start up. So our original design was that when a Cassandra using service booted up, it would apply any necessary migrations to its Cassandra database. But of course, as soon as you start horizontally scaling your services and having multiple instances of them, you could potentially deadlock or cause a bit of a mess if two of them try and migrate at once. It, it's probably workable around, but using a Kubernetes job triggered by a Helm hook seemed like a less messy way to do it. And that's the way we do our relational migrations as well. 
that's about the only thing I can say. Everything else, as I say, has been really quite smooth sailing. Um, so Cassandra now is just part of our business as usual. Uh, perhaps one one victim of its success is that we struggle to maintain a decent level of knowledge in the developer team just because the code that's doing all this has worked so well for a number of years that not everyone who did the original implementation is still around. Obviously, people have come and go. Um, the only reason our ops team sort of have a, a greater level of familiarity is because they force themselves to do routine disaster recovery, sort of backup and restore exercises. But likewise, I think they've found of all the different data stores we use in different places on our platform, I think it's fair to say I can't remember a situation where Cassandra got corrupted or otherwise caused a problem, whereas we have occasionally tripped ourselves up, even with things like Postgres, which is among the most reliable and hands off of the relational databases. We have occasionally tripped up there. We have occasionally had problems in other areas, but this has been a happy story. So what are we going to do in the future? Well, we've got a few more applications coming up where a no SQL store might be just a thing for performance and for other reasons. Um, in fact, we're making our first sort of foray into additional Cassandra usage in our stack uh, for a number of years. Uh, we're using it to support a new set of APIs for providing sort of a richer set of metadata about those financial tables I've just been showing that will support more complicated data entry scenarios. It's been quite interesting looking at the sort of three or four new members of the team we've hired in the last six months and watching them just start to work with Cassandra. In some ways, actually, you're better off because there are fewer major versions of it out there and there's only one of it. If you're searching for how to do something with a relational database, you can get stuck in a maze of articles. Like there have been 13 major versions of Postgres and every relational database has its own quirks and idiosyncrasies. You find a nice solution to doing something written in terms of SQL Server. It doesn't translate to what you're working with. Um, you're sometimes frustrated by the lowest common denominator of your kind of object relational mapper library. But yeah, in some ways, Cassandra is just there's less of it and it's more narrowly focused. So if you go Googling for solutions, you find them and you don't tend to have to analyze them quite so hard to make them work. So, so far the feedback we've had from the new starters has been really positive. They are figuring it out. We're getting some quite good throughput on this round of work. So yeah, it's clear that Cassandra is with us to stay and it's been a pretty happy story of, um, an application for us that perhaps steers neatly into the wheelhouse of NoSQL, partly because there isn't such a rigid structure or set of joins to the data, partly because performance based on our prototyping seemed to be a lot easier to achieve good performance with this particular sort of store. The supporting infrastructure is all there. It works. We love it. Thank you to everyone who made it. So I did say I perhaps wouldn't quite talk for the uh, the full set of time, but if anyone wants to pitch in with a question in the chat, I will do my best to answer them. Uh, I'll pop my slides and the speaker notes I've been referring to on my Apache page. I understand this is all going to be recorded and put onto YouTube in the next week or so. Those are my contact details. Thank you very much. Questions in the uh, in the chat. So some interesting points in the chat there about schema migration. Now, uh, luckily, in most of our deployments, we can live with a couple of minutes downtime during updates. However, there's a fair point there about trying to support zero downtime rolling upgrades, which is something we're trying to iterate towards and take more seriously. Point being made that relational databases will generally lock tables while they're altering the schema, whereas in Cassandra, you've got a much better chance by the sounds of it, of it continuing to work normally whilst you add a couple of columns. I think it's also fair to say that 
you tend to have a less complicated structure with Cassandra because you don't have relations between things. Perhaps as a very crude rule of thumb, perhaps you have fewer and bigger uh, tables. I think most of our migrations are entire new tables rather than alterations to existing ones. So that's also perhaps less of an issue for downtime. Um, but yeah, so once we've worked out the tooling, we've got something we're happy with. And I think that's interesting points I'll take back to our DevOps team as we try and work towards a world where we don't cause downtime during upgrades and we sort of iterate towards a more continuous model. Can I show you the table schema? Well, that's a fair question. Um, give me a moment and I will see if I can. I'm just going to uh, just going to temporarily, if I can, temporarily knock the screen share off there whilst I go fishing. Um, I was hoping to have it in the slides, but I uh, slightly run out of time when preparing them. It's not particularly meant to be a trade secret. So give me a minute and we'll see what we can come up with. Yeah, I think I've um, I think I found the right thing. So, just going to go back on the uh, back on the screen share here with it now. So, there you are. So this is the uh, CQL for at least the first version of what we did. So there were a few more details perhaps than I that I glossed over, but the Essentially, I was I was describing this, so I'll run you through it from the top here. Uh, labels uh, is there to reflect the fact that you can have labels in multiple different languages for the um, for the headers in the table, for the rows and the columns. So that's why, and in fact, you can have multiple different types of label. You can sort of have different classes of label in the standard. Um, then you've got the fact table, which is. Um, which is for the values in the cells. You can have multiple values in one cell, which is a complication I skipped over, which is why facts and cells are modeled separately here. It's not enough just to have a cell because you can have multiple facts sitting in it. Um, then you've got your tables table that sort of ties together um, which document it relates to, some IDs and some basic numbers that tell you how many uh, headers you should be looking up in other places, um, cells represented, issues looked up by, um, by cell, and uh, some materialized views there just to make it a little bit easier for us to look things up. Headers, as I mentioned, and then versions is just because you can have multiple versions of a document, so we just index them accordingly. So uh, a point being made in the comments there that uh, create if not exists, as you can see here, apparently can cause um, can cause nodes to get out of sync with each other, at least uh, at least. Uh, so that's perhaps something I uh, can take back to my ops team and make us aware of. So I think this goes back quite a few years and we've um, as far as we know, we haven't had any problems, but perhaps it's. Uh, Perhaps it's something to iterate on. I'm not sure this needs to be idempotent in our application. So I'm not sure that the if not exist stuff needs to be there, unless perhaps we've just done it this way to make it a little bit easier for ourselves in test scenarios, but perhaps have strayed slightly, um, slightly from where we wanted to be. OK, so that would be a permanent breakage potentially. So. Uh, that's definitely something that I will uh, take away and take a look at with my team. But yes, so concurrent, uh, 
if, if you're running concurrent migration or you're doing that, what I said with multiple services, doing it to multiple nodes simultaneously. All right, any other uh, questions people wanted to chip in with? Okay, well, thank you very much for coming, everyone. I know it's the last session of the day, and uh, whether it's dark outside where you are or not, I know it's been uh, a long day of staring at screens and interacting, so I do appreciate the audience. I hope you learned something from it. Um, I, <laughs> I learned a few things from the, from the comments there that I can take back and talk to the team about, so very much appreciated. Thank you again for coming, and slides and video will be up in the next week or so. Thank you.